Hey, what's up, guys? I recently sat down and did an interview over the phone with Charlie Alamo. Uh, he does The Lame Show. Uh, I'll put all the descriptions of where you can find his show and be able to download it. His website will be in the description of this video. But in this first clip, I talk a little bit about a prank that Ron and Fez used to play on me all the time where they would leave me in the studio to fend for myself, not even knowing how to run the board. Uh, I was only six months in as an intern, and they did this to me. Ron and Fez would pull this prank on me all the time. They would look at me and they were like, oh, so you think this is easy what we do? You think you can do this? They would leave me in the studio by myself, not knowing how to run the board, being able to go to break, take phone calls or anything. They would leave me in there for 10 minutes and they would let me absolutely bomb. They didn't care how much dead air there was. They just left me in the studio for 10 minutes and they said, have fun with the show. See what you can do with it. It was bad, but it was funny because people like that cringe type of humor. They see somebody bombing or it's just real life. It was real because I was struggling. And yes, it does seem like it, at the time a dick thing to do, but it made me tougher and, and really don't care about what people think or care about me. Does that make sense? It makes complete sense. And actually, Ron and Fez is the type of show, because I, I listened to a lot of it uh, back in the day, uh, was a show that if they didn't pull pranks and did stuff to you like that, if they didn't, you know, rib yeah. you a bit, then you weren't in with them. Because uh -huh. I remember listening to interns that they didn't prank or do anything with, and they would try to just put yeah. them, give them bits, and they wouldn't even do that, so they would just stop using them. But isn't that a great way to learn, like, you know, to just be thrown to the wolves like that, and just say, hey, sink or swim, man. Yes, it was bad, but it gave me that confidence. Like, if, if I can be thrown in there with little to no radio experience, it, it made me a better broadcaster. It's one of those little things that I look back at and, and, and say, hey, that made me a better broadcaster. Ron and Fez would pull this prank on me all the time. They would look at me, and they were like, oh, so you think this is easy what we do? You think you can do this? They would leave me in the studio by myself, not knowing how to run the board, being able to go to break, take phone calls or anything. They would leave me in there for 10 minutes and they would let me absolutely bomb. They didn't care how much dead air there was. They just left me in the studio for 10 minutes and they said, have fun with the show see what you could do with it. It was bad, but it was funny because people like that cringe type of humor. They see somebody bombing or it's just real life. It was real because I was struggling. And yes, it does seem like at the time a dick thing to do, but it made me tougher and, and really don't care about what people think or care about. In this next clip with Charlie, we discuss the legend, the man, the myth himself, Neil Rogers, and how he does not get enough credit when it comes to radio broadcasting. Neil Rogers does not get the accolades on a national level like he should. Um, you know, in the state of Florida, he was a legend, and, mm -hmm. and even more in South Florida. Um, you know, and with Phil Hendry as well, too, you know, a lot of people don't realize that Phil Hendry was doing a lot of the voices on that station down there. And um, uh, I, I became a fan of Phil Hendry's because at Real Radio, they had hired him. It wasn't live. They recorded the show and they replayed him the overnights. But it was just like one of those unique things because nobody was doing radio like Phil Hendry. And for Neil to do the type of radio he did, you know, because he was this strong powerful voice and and you know a lot of people did not want to mess with him because he carried a lot of power and weight and he was a homosexual which i have no problem with that it just was such a unique mix of being a gay man having that much power and pull in in a city like miami you know and it was the way that he he came out too was just like oh i'm gay and didn't and you know and made references to it all the time but it wasn't a big deal nobody nobody really nobody said anything he about wasn't it using it he wasn't using it as a gimmick he wasn't like you know he wasn't using it as a wrestler like you know i everything i do has to be gay or gay related you know as a gimmick no he it was just he was a talk show host that happened to be gay, and he really didn't make a lot of big deal about it. No, he's completely underrated, and the only guy that I know where he made uh, the Beasley's 
make him three different compounds. He had one in Amsterdam, the one in Toronto, and then yeah. uh, his one there yeah. in Florida that he'd go to. That's legendary. People don't do that anymore. In this next piece of audio, we briefly discuss about the unnecessary evil of being on social media when it comes to working in radio now because it's something you have to do to be able to keep your name out there. And it's something that program directors and, and, and consultants look at. They look at your social media numbers and how you engage your audience. So this is what we talked about with Charlie. It's a necessary evil of having to do social media to keep your name out there. Because, you know, I try to tell people nowadays, program directors and GMs and, and, and people look at when they hire a new disc jockey or a host, they they want to look, Hey, what does this social media following look like? You know, they look at that type of stuff now. And, and it's very, very important to do and keep your name out there. It's sad. Do I like that? I have to do it. No, but it's just something you got to do. Did you think that, um, social media would get to the point where so many people would like lose their job and stuff as it happened early on with it. It doesn't seem to be happening now as much. People seem to no, use it, it more to just it shame, but it does not, it does not happen as much, but like, you know, luckily I've been working at radio stations and formats that really have never have told us what we can or cannot say, but you also got to just be smart of, Hey, is this going to get me in trouble? Because you got a lot of sponsors that are paying money for you to rep their brand. So if you say something that they don't agree with, you could lose some money. So yeah, I mean, a lot of people have lost their jobs, but social media is just a way of engaging your audience. You know, this is even before I got into radio back in the day, the whole mystique about radio was that you didn't even know what your favorite disc jockey or talk show host look like. You know, you had to go to a promotion or, or a public appearance to see what they look like. But now it's like there's no mystique to it anymore. And finally, I spoke with Charlie about how Janet Jackson's nipple costs a lot of radio broadcasters their jobs and how we broadcast, how the FCC rules on us. And uh, we got picked on. Just because of Janet Jackson and Justin Timberlake decided to have a wardrobe malfunction, we all got screwed. What the stupid Janet Jackson nipple gate sent a ripple effect through broadcasting. And, and this is the sad part about it is that radio being, and, and I'll admit, you got like movies, TV shows, broadcast news. And radio is at the bottom. Radio has had to take one for the team when it came to that. So, yeah, I think radio really suffered when they had nothing to do with it. Yeah, it, it just looks like because afterwards you see everybody who got fined and then not too long after Howard Stern leaves and kind of goes and does his own thing. So it really, uh, that cost a lot of people I work. Mean, they wanted to take it out on us because they couldn't look through the real people that it was really. So, you know, they went after Bubba Loves Funds. They went after Howard Stern. They went after all this stuff, you know, just to make us pay for it. And, and we had nothing to do with the goddamn thing.